have Suzanne Lenoir from the chemistry or from the computer science department. <laughs> so sorry, I know it's computer science. And um, Julie Silk, who is from Agilent, but she's also the executive director for Expanding Your Horizons, which she will talk about further. And um, just to remind you all, next week we have um, the physics chanteuse coming. And the week after that, we have Carmen speaking and Shona Mukherjee, from, both from SSU. Okay, so thank you, ladies. Thank you. Yay, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that, a success for women in technology already. So um, I thought I would talk a little bit about women in technology in general and then about what I do as a woman in technology. I'm really glad that the library decided to break this series out by discipline a little bit because there's a very familiar story that gets told about really any minority in any field, but I'll say women in science since that's what we're talking about, um, which is women in science or minority in field uh, faced at first insurmountable obstacles, then a few very brave pioneers did great things and we still know their names today. Then, little by little, women started making strides in this field, and now we have equality in some ways, and we're still trying to make progress in others. So there's this assumption of forward progress and this upward trajectory that often underlies these tales, and that may be what you're expecting to hear. But in technology, unlike in other fields of science, that really hasn't been the case. So let me tell you that story, and let me tell it to you backwards. So here's a snapshot of a relatively recent year, the most recent one I could find data for. And this is about um, something very familiar to us in this part of the country, which is startup culture and companies. Um, so in 2004, about 19% of all new companies across the board were founded by women in tech. And this actually, this doesn't correspond to my definition of tech in this talk. I'm gonna be using the term narrowly to talk about computing, electrical and computer engineering and IT, sort of the more hands-on cousin to computer science, this is actually broader than that. And yet still, 3% of new firms were founded by women. So looking back a little more and going beyond just the notion of founding a company, this is some longitudinal data about women's representation in the scientific workforce. So this is on the uh, y-axis, we have the percentage of women, the percentage of people working in that field who are women. The uh, high bar up there would be your life sciences. The orange bar is your physicians and surgeons, and the yellow bar is us. So you're probably noting the difference in magnitudes right away. So if you just pull together a bunch of women in science, the likelihood is that most of them will be life scientists. So I'm very grateful that technology is represented at all in this series. But also notice the trajectory. Blue and orange are following the progress narrative I told you about. Yellow, not so much. Something entirely different is happening with us. We can't take for granted forward progress with the passage of time. So this is the science workforce. Let's work our way backward to, we're in a university, so to education. What about bachelor's degrees? And so here we're looking at 1984 through 2009. This is raw numbers of women and men earning bachelor's degrees in computing fields, computer and information sciences. You can see the big spike during the dot-com boom for both women and men. You can see it falling off afterward, disproportionately for women. Things are ramping up a little bit in recent years that we don't have this data for yet. Um, but actually, if you work your way backward into the 80s, you can see that relative to men, the numbers of women actually look quite a bit better. Um, and in fact, the high watermark for the percentage of women in computer science in universities was the year 1982, when we were at 38%. Going backward in time farther to one of the very first computers ever created, the ENIAC, which was operational from 1946 to 1955, there are all these old photos of that system that look like this, with these women in it. And so the question is, what are they doing? And there was a filmmaker who asked this question, and what people said is, oh, you know, I don't know, I guess secretary's posing with the equipment, probably. These are the first programmers of the ENIAC. So women with computational skills were valuable in this new industry, especially during the war and immediately after. This was a field that was hospitable to women. And so what happened? Um, I don't know what happened, but I can tell you some things that didn't happen. So I can tell you that it's not that women aren't prepared to go into a highly mathematical field. So what we're seeing here is the raw numbers of men and women, men are blue, women are green, 
taking different AP tests in 2011, so the most recent data the College Board has. As you can see, a ton of men and women take AP calculus, and the split is fairly even. So it's not that women aren't prepared mathematically. If you look at the numbers for computer science, you can see two things. One, almost no one takes this exam relative to even other sciences, and number two, those who do are almost exclusively men. So almost no one is exposed to this or really any other non-core subject these days in high school. So it's not like women are turning away from this field because they know what it is and have rejected it. And it's not like women are turning away from this field because they're not prepared. So then certainly some people start looking to biological explanations and the data defies that as well. So um, I'm about to show you some international data. The numbers here are both old and sketchy. It's just really hard to compare what different countries mean by computer science. But I picked data points that I know a little bit about independently, so they're not completely bogus, I promise. Um, so this is at least one year, one definition of computing, um, where you had about 26.7% of degrees in, that, in the, those fields in the United States going to women. Here's another couple data points, 10.5% in Germany, 41% in Iran. So if you're gonna have a biological explanation about women in this field, it needs to be prepared to hold up to these cultural realities. The most interesting data point, and one that has only accelerated, is actually Malaysia, where computing actually, so this is a 1991 number, where computing is now a seriously majority women field and is even in danger of being a pink color ghetto. So this is a field that women have moved into because you can do it sitting at a desk. You can do it without necessarily interacting with a bunch of people of the opposite gender. And there are a lot of conservative Muslims in Malaysia who really like that. And so this has become a field for women there. So any biological explanation needs to explain these cultural realities. So now we're in a bad, bad situation where this becomes self-perpetuating. Because in the United States, unlike in some of these other places, there are a lot of ways for women to succeed. So why would a woman go into a field that's having these problems in this case, unless she loves it? But how could she know she loves it, given the AP numbers I just showed you? So it's a really difficult problem that we're dealing with in this country at this point. Um, there's hope that with the recent surges in enrollment that I haven't shown you in this data, that we're gonna bring women in as a result of that. There's hope that as technology is something that all of us use, as opposed to something that men use, that women will become interested first as users and then come into this field wanting to design that technology. But it's far from clear, and we can't possibly be smug that progress is going to be upward when we see the very turbulent course that things have taken in the past. So with that sort of um, glum and vague uh, description of where we are right now, I want to just talk a little bit about how I, as one particular woman, got into this field and what I do. So um, my story actually starts um, when I began college. So notice not when I was four years old and started programming my first computer, you know, not when I was eight years old and hacked into the Pentagon, uh, but when I was 17 years old and selecting a college major at the University of Texas, which is where I'm from. Um, and like most 17 year olds, I didn't have the uh, really most thought out rationale for what to do with my life. Um, but from a feminist standpoint, not that I would have used those words then, um, I really wanted to be very sure that I could support myself. Um, so I just looked at a list of the highest paying majors and this was being 1998, electrical engineering was at the top of that list, at least for my university. And so I said, well, I've always wanted to know if I'm any good at math, let's start there and see what happens, I guess. Um, and so I learned a lot of things. Um, I learned very quickly, I started gravitating to some parts of the field over others. I started gravitating toward digital systems, which are ruled by a very formal, very logical way of thinking. Um, I started gravitating toward the way humans design these incredibly complex systems, the tools we've built to deal with that complexity so that we don't have to think about all of it at once, um, and toward the courses that one by one sort of peeled back every layer of what goes on in a computer from programming it at the application level to understanding where the subatomic particles are actually going that make this thing really physically work. And so what you're seeing here is, I think I have a diagram representing every different level that you see as an electrical engineering major, from at least from the hardware point of view. Um, and by the time I was done with this, I didn't know what to make of it, but I thought I would learn a little more, so I went on to graduate school. And 
there I started specializing, and this is actually meant to be absolutely terrifying and look like a completely boring stereotype of computing. I, I think I've succeeded. I think that looks pretty awful. I know what all of it means, too. Um, so I started specifically going into computer architecture, which is how do we make really dry-looking diagrams explaining how uh, computer components, especially processors, should work at a conceptual level. Um, and what I actually learned is that this is an incredibly human-centered field. So this very dry seeming and, let's be honest, looking area of computer science that even within computer science is not coded as especially female at all, starts from the question, well, what do people want to do with computers these days? Because how can we possibly design them before we assess that? Then, OK, how are people, again, people, willing to trade off the different things we can do for them? What blend of performance and cost and security and reliability and energy consumption is best for what people want and what people are trying to do? How can we look around to what's going on in physics, what's going on in manufacturing and the underlying technology and try and harness the developments that are happening in those fields every day and put them to work for what people want to do? So this field, it is an engineering field in the sense of we're designing things rather than just asking questions about the natural world. And when you're designing something, it's not enough to write a piece of, to write a paper and say, look, I designed something. You have to explain why you bothered. And so if you read papers in our field, they're full of persuasive argument about why this is the right thing given what people want to do. Uh, my sister, who's actually a physicist, uh, has commented on this. She said, you know, I, I didn't know really why you were getting into this area. And then I read your papers and I sort of realized just how many words there actually are. It's definitely true. This, this, this is a field that starts with a macro look at what's needed in the world and then tries to answer that question. And I think that's true of engineering as a whole. So what I do specifically these days um, is, again, centered around really first starting with what do people need from computers and trying to address those challenges. And specifically, I've done most of my non-educational work in the area of green computing. Um, so there have been two major projects that I've worked on that have been incredibly exciting. Um, so one of them was looking at how do we quantify, how do we come up with a measure for what it means for computing to be energy efficient. So being low power is easy to understand. You plug your computer into a power meter, you look at the power meter, we're done here. Um, but the question is, what is it doing with the energy it uses? And is it doing better than another computer? Is it doing the best that it can? Um, so one of the projects I was involved in there was to design what actually turned out to be the first benchmark to put a number on this question. And if you think about it, this is an incredibly subjective thing to be talking about, right? I have to make an argument about why this trade-off of power and performance, why this way of summarizing energy efficiency makes sense given what people want to be doing with computers. So before I can even start talking about measurements and before I can even get technical, I have to explain why, in context, this is the way to do things. So we did that. We looked at the insights that came from starting to quantify things. You know, they say you can't address what you can't measure. So once we started measuring, we started learning a lot. And we learned about new ways to design systems that maximized energy efficiency. And these proposals that sounded completely crazy at the time um, have been adopted pretty widely. So there are some really exciting new research systems um, in, at Johns Hopkins um, and at Carnegie Mellon as well as what Facebook and Google are willing to tell you about the servers that they've designed in-house that take advantage of these ideas, which has been really exciting. Um, and the second area that I've worked on has been looking at how can we model the amount of power a computer is consuming based on what's, what it's actually doing in software. So how can we get a little more abstract and link those two things together? And then how do those models hold up as we try to apply them across different types of machines as technology evolves, as people start doing different things with their computers? Do the models still hold up? As we start to scale these models from a single machine up to a data center, you know, multiple football field sized building full of computers. And then how can we use these models since we're able to now predict power based on what we're trying to do with these machines? How can we use these models to optimize the energy efficiency of a group of machines? And so these are the projects that I've been working in um, in graduate school and beyond to be here. Um, and so if these projects sound really practical and really industry focused, they absolutely are. And so every project I've worked on as an academic, I haven't left the university setting, um, has been in really close cooperation with one or another industrial partner. So Cray, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, um, Google. And 
so the question is, why do this from an academic perch at all? And so I think this goes back to the initial numbers that I showed you. So again, I don't know why we have a shortage of women in technology. I don't know why there's not the slow and steady march of forward progress that everybody expects to hear in a situation like this. Um, but I absolutely know that um, just about every woman who steps into this field uh, for the first time in a university ends up at some point with a crisis of conscience that plays out along very gendered lines. And I know that every visible woman who's in an established position uh, that that woman sees plays a role in that dialogue she's having with herself. Um, so I know I just showed you a very grandiose slide about saving the world, and I'm going to say one more grandiose thing, um, which is that I'm here because I want to help out in a very small way with getting the trajectory of women in technology back on a reasonable track. Thank you. Julie, do you want to go ahead? Are there questions for me? Or do you want to do it at the end? Jen, yeah. So you showed the, the, the bar graph where the students that take the AP calculus, it's about 50 50 mm -hmm. with men. But when you, when you teach your classes that you're at Sonoma State or just in people you come into contact with, do you get the same feeling that women are as into math as that bar graph suggests? Um, so, you know, if we're going anecdotal, I think it's definitely true that if you look at the highest reaches of academic math, women are once again, I guess Ben's here, why am I talking about this, but um, are, are underrepresented. But I've seen, if you look at like the Putnam exam and the really, really elite tests of undergraduate math at least, I've seen more women doing well at those just in the amount of time I've been paying attention. Um, if you look sort of more casually, you know, I find at least, again, really anecdotally, that our female students are very willing to say, yes, you know, I am good at math, um, but they're not making the connection that computer science is math related. So one thing I didn't show you um, that I that was actually in the same data set I was pulling from um, shows the math SAT scores of entering freshmen in different fields. And um, as Ben, I'm sure, would be happy to know if he doesn't already, math sort of leads the pack. So the would-be math students have the highest math SAT scores. Then you have sort of your physics majors, your other sciences, then sort of your history, your philosophy, and then computer science over here. Even though computer science started as you know a fusion of math and electrical engineering and is still basically there today. So students are just not encountering this field in high school. All they have is, you know, they play video games, they've maybe put together a computer. And so the image of what this field is is not what it's going to feel like to study it in an academic setting. And there's no way to get the word out in a situation where our K-12 education is so focused on the core disciplines. So there's a huge initiative to address this program called um, Computing Education for the 21st Century, CE21, um, that came you know, from the Obama administration straight to the NSF. Um, they're trying to get 10,000 new computer science teachers in high schools, but if you talk to the top people researching that effort, they think there's absolutely no way it can happen in the constraints we're under, no matter how much will and how much funding there is. Just can't get people up to speed that quickly and in this setting. So it's pretty unlikely to change, at least to change quickly. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And Julie, hopefully that switches to you. Looks like it's paused. Oh, it's Well, so that was very interesting, um, and I might play a little off of some of your statistics because I don't have all those statistics and all that, you know, detail. Um, I wasn't sure until a couple days ago that I was, I was even going to have slides. I was just going to talk. So anyway, we will um, go from there. Uh, okay. So I just want to talk a little bit about myself. I'm an engineer for Agilent Technologies, um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about my past and how I got into that and. Um, you know, that kind of leads to why I'm so motivated to get more women into um, science and technology through some of the other things that I do. So, um, isn't that a cute picture? My mom gave it to me at my 50th birthday. Anyway, um, I came from a really small town in western Washington state. Um, the main things there were farming and logging. Um, if, you know, most girls were not going on to college. In fact, out of my school of 400, there were only six students that went to a four-year college at all. So I was one of the ones who did, um, but it, it just wasn't a real focus there. You know, I mean, I think the most uh, most women would aspire to might be being a teller at the bank or something. You know, and this was admittedly, you know, a long time ago. But um, anyway, there were no role models as far as engineering. 
Um, I was good at math and science, um, and I liked them. And I was advised, well, you could be a teacher. And I thought, I don't want to teach. So teaching's great. I don't have the temperament or something for it. Anyway, so that was not of interest to me at all. So I didn't know what I was going to do, but I think that there was a similar thing there in that I wanted to make sure that I would make a decent living. I mean, I, uh, you know, I don't even understand how from my, my parents who were, you know, blue collar, uh, hadn't gone to college, you know, why they instilled in us that we would go to college, but that was definitely a thing. We would go to college. I think partly they wanted us out of the house, <laughs> so I think that was part of it. But um, I also, you know, I also wanted to get out of the house, get out of the area, and um, and go do something on my own. And again, looking at engineering salaries, it's like, oh, that looks good. But what is that? I don't even know. But um, we did have something at um, the University of Washington. Um, so it was like this four-hour drive. We went up, me and a friend with you know, our moms, and attended this thing, Women in Engineering. And it's like, whoa. These people are doing really cool stuff. You're designing things, you're making things, you're improving things, whatever. It's like, okay, that sounds like something I'd like to do. I can use this math and science, I can solve problems. You know, that's about all I knew. I enrolled in University of Washington um, as an engineering student. And not even knowing what are the different kinds of engineering, I knew almost nothing. So, um, uh, settling on what I was going to do is, you know, not mechanical. I, I was, it was awful. Of course, it was, you know, it was physical drawing at that time, too, and it was really not, not my thing. Um, I don't get electronics, even though I work for an electronics firm. It's like, it do, it's not, uh, it doesn't work for me. Um, chemistry is more intuitive, you know, and, and I, it works in my brain somehow. So it's like, that's what I decided to go into. I went into chemical engineering, and, um, and I was, um, I actually was, uh, had a chance to look at some of the demographics, um, partly because um, I had a friend who wanted to know if he could do a persuasive argument. And so when we were in this meeting, um, he elected me, or he nominated me to be um, um, one of the officers in Tau Beta Pi, the Engineering Honor Society. And he wanted to just see if he could do it, and he did, and I got this job of figuring out you know, who we would invite, but I could see the demographics then of you know, about, um, at that time, 20% of chemical engineering were female, but in mechanical engineering and electrical engineering, about 10% of the students were female. And this is back in the 80s, so, well, maybe a little before the 80s. So it was, um, it, it's something where you think, okay, we could make this better. And, and again, I think the demographics haven't really changed as much as I would like to see, um, but uh, I'm, I'm working on that. So anyway, I went into chemical engineering, and I think, the important thing that I want to say, especially to any students here, is what you get your degree in does not always relate to what you do. So um, I, I had a summer job at Hewlett Packard here in Santa Rosa. That's kind of how I made my initial connections there. Um, but then after college, I went to work at an oil refinery because that's really what chemical engineers do. And then I got a call that there was an opening down here, so I came down. So I was an engineer in the plating shop, you know, chemical stuff, you know, so that actually kind of made sense. It wasn't really anything that we studied, but it was, you know, chemicals are happening there. But then I went um, to be an engineer for a solder process, and that was more optimization and lowering defect rates. Um, the assembly process, similar, solving any problems that would come up, you know, every day there'd be something different that would come, and we'd have to figure out solutions on the fly. Um, from there to how to design for manufacturing. So the designs are going on, they're, they're trying to design impossible things. So we need to make that compromise between what is um, what the electrical engineer needs and what we can do physically and, and meld that to get the best solution so that we can get, you know, have good quality for whatever it is that they need and you know, not have to pay too much to get it done because it's something impossible. So, um, and then I worked, we started subcontracting out our assembly so this is a printed circuit boards, and um, so I started working with them and developing the, the relationship with them and on the technical side and how we communicate, how we send data, you know, uh, evaluating them, all that kind of thing. Um, and you can see we're, we're really, really far from chemical engineering now and, and the oil refinery typical setting for a chemical engineer. Um, and then I decided to try to do research and development um, uh, project manager, and uh, that was the, the uh, 
telecom bust, and so that didn't last long. <laughs> but anyway, again, I, there's where I'm actually working with electrical engineers who are designing a product, and you know, so I don't even know what they're talking about, but guiding through a project and, and making decisions. I mean, that's something that you, you know how to do, or you learn how to do, or you use logic and um, um, relationships with other departments and whatever to pull that together. Somewhere in here, um, HP became Agilent. So, and then there were some other things with rolling out new engineering systems or engineering, um, you know, where we store our data and the business systems and how those all relate. Again, really, really far from chemical engineering. And then um, I went back into design for manufacturing and dealing with contract manufacturers. There's some new stuff we were doing there. And right now what I am doing is I'm leading the technical program for our conversion to lead-free solder. It's the whole uh, European Union um, restriction of hazardous substances um, will be in scope in a few years. We need to get rid of the lead in the solder. There's the industry is working on these issues with, um, the, I mean, you'd think that sounds great, but the, the solder is like 35 degrees C hotter in melting point and um, all the materials have to be different and they get damaged and all sorts of stuff goes on and there's things we've never used before we suddenly have to use and all the 40 years of history with you know, tin lead solder we have to abandon and we don't know what's going to happen. So people have been studying this for quite some time now. And um, I'm in on that because with all the other work, I've become somewhat of an expert on printed circuit assemblies and quality and that sort of thing. And um, now I'm learning more about metallurgy and um, uh, you know, material, plastic materials and, and um, how to do reliability testing and all that kind of thing. I've got 13 different projects going on um, throughout the, with different leaders throughout the world. Some are subcontracting, some are done by engineers in Malaysia, um, many of which are women. And um, um, so it, there's a whole bunch of things going on, a bunch of things to balance, but um, driving forward to try to get the answers we need so that our products will um, continue to be reliable. So um, I have a few samples that I was going to pass around just so you can see what some of these things look like. So and these got tossed in here at some point. So um, here, for instance, is a printed circuit board. So many of you may not have seen that. And this we designed with a beautiful blue color because we thought that it would work. And it turns out it doesn't really work that well. <laughs> the, the, it doesn't image as well as green. So you can't get as fine of, of lines. But it has a whole bunch of different kinds of parts on here, you know, big strange things for our high frequency circuits, um, a bunch of other parts. Um, pass that around. So uh, yeah, these are the things we want to make sure are reliable. We have, um, I have here um, micro circuits. So these are very tiny parts that um, are, are very high frequency circuits that are needed. And you can see there's, it's hard in the dark especially, but there are teeny tiny parts in there. Um, they're on, um, I think it's sapphire circuitry um, that works at very high frequencies. Everything's gold plated because the, um, at high frequencies everything travels along the surface. So some of those um, parts in there too also had to change to lead free to materials that really aren't responding quite the same in some ways. So that's um, some other things that we need to, to explore. And then I have a couple of test boards here. We put these big shields on uh, some of our circuits because uh, we have to make sure that different parts of the circuit don't talk to each other and have frequency that can happen. So um, I was testing to see if the new finishes, because we used to use tin lead on our finish, very robust, it you know, survives humidity, all sorts of things, but we had to change. So it's, this is trying out um, some, other, some other stuff. And if, what I find, why I brought this one is, I, I put it through various um, of the processes that go through, um, that, that printed circuit boards have to go through. There's like you know, three cycles of, of high heat. And so one of them was I put on a through hole part just to put it through that process. But that's the one that actually ended up failing. The, the zinc body is actually turning into zinc oxide. And you can see that the legs back there are white and the, the plating is splayed out. The, uh, the zinc oxide has higher volume, so it just like exploded kind of and left little white specks all over the floor of the 
the humidity chamber. I was freaking out. I thought it was my, you know, silver plating that's on there, and it turns out it wasn't, so that was good. But one of the other things, too, that happens with the, um, the, uh, the new solder is it's more prone to drop shock, like with your phone, when you, you know, you drop it, it falls apart, and they were finding a higher rate of um, failure because of that damage. And so I did some testing on um, figuring out whether the new laminates, which of the new laminates were better or worse than others by dropping them and doing dye and pry, we uh, soak them in dye and pry them apart and see where the failures are. So that's um, some more. So, as you can see, a little bit about that dye and, and you can tell where things have failed with that. So with all this, I've sort of become this expert on printed circuit um, um, solder joints and reliability of printed circuit boards. So I wanted to just show you a few of the things that I've been working on recently. And this is, this is the new solder that we use, tin, silver, copper. We call it SAC. And um, this is like what it looks like to start with. We apply solder paste between our part and our board. And, um, and then we solder it and you end up with this bulk solder. And then you have intermetallic compounds that form throughout. And um, these can have different results. So uh, this is a micrograph of a solder joint that's been sliced through. And there's um, silver tin intermetallics throughout. And there's gold tin intermetallics here. We were studying the effect of gold on this kind of solder because nobody had done that. Anyway, this is what, kind of what the part looks like. It's, uh, it's got a, a big underbelly here that we solder down, and then each of the little pins we, we also solder down. And then, oops. And so this is what a joint looks like when it's not doing too well. So this is um, some fracture through the gold tin intermetallic. And again, fractures here. And then this is a fracture right at the intermetallic surface um, at the interface. And that's the kind of thing that can make your product stop working. So these are the kinds of things we needed to study to figure out what's, what's going on. What do, we need to, um, what do we need to design differently? How do we need to specify our components? Um, what do we need to do maybe with the solder that would help mediate these kinds of problems? We deliberately put too much gold in these. We have, so you have these gold tin inner metallics that are extremely brittle, and, and that can cause real problems. So. But it, this is the kind of stuff I'm doing, a bunch of experimentation, trying a bunch of things to figure out how we can give better design advice to our engineers so that they can um, design better products. Anyway, so with all this though, you know, with my experience with the complete lack of role models in my town, um, I really got a passion for um, encouraging girls to go into math and science, engineering, anything, because um, I think also often girls want to change the world. They want to fix things. They want to, you know, nurture the earth or nurture, you know, make make things better. And I, I think what they often don't see is that engineering is a great way to do that because we actually can make a difference, usually in our own small way, right? I mean, it's our we have our own sphere of influence. Maybe it's not huge, but that you can. Can, and you're part of something that can make, that make improvements. So um, I just want to make sure that they know what it is and that it's one of their options. Um, you know, her statistics were way better than my vague, you know, 10 to 20 percent. But I was just at a conference last week and, you know, it's, um, we're definitely the minority. We have our, we had our women, women in, in um, technology breakfast, you know, and so there were, you know, a bunch of us there. It's very exciting. It's really very exciting to all get together. But you're in a conference room, you know, you're, you're listening to somebody's paper, and I'm, I'm kind of doing a mental count, and out of, you know, 100 people, there are maybe 10 women or something. Um, it's really very common, um, especially some of the other things that I go to. It's, you know, maybe there's three out of 20, or, you know, the, the, the ratio is always really small. It doesn't bother me, though. I mean, other than at first you get noticed, especially your voice on the phone, because I do a lot of my work on teleconferences, you know. Like, oh, is that so-and-so? It's like, oh, no, it's, of the three women, I'm one of them, but, you know, they get <laughs> mixed up a lot, because they just assume, you know. But, um, but also, I, what I find, though, in this arena, though, the men really, I mean, after some of the older ones, you know, retire, anyway, that they, they don't care what gender you are, they care about what you can answer for them and what you could do for them and what you could fix and what you could solve. 
they don't really care what gender you are at all. So, um, you know, I always try to sort of pay forward, do, um, you know, answer more, you know, answer what they need and um, do more than what they needed um, and always be that sort of the go-to resource for whatever my topic is. And I think that that's really, you know, served me well through all of Agilent's troubles too. So anyway, but I think it is a, 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 an area where you can make a difference. I mean, you know, I, I think about um, you know, some of the troubles in the world and even just, you know, good sanitation in some regions of the world. I mean, that's something that engineers could go in and do. Um, uh, you know, just with all I do is really make sure that our products are better quality and that they have fewer toxic materials in them. So, I mean, that's that's my little little piece of, of that world. And and uh, but I can do you know as good of a job as I can at that. Um, I encourage girls to go into some of these other things, and maybe we can make things improved all around. So, in order to do this. Thing that was my passion. Um, it started out when I was fairly young and, and just started here. There was a women in mathematics forum kind of thing where they'd send us out to grade school classes and we'd do a little, you know, demonstration and hands on something or other. And uh, there was a group of us from that that um, decided to take, uh, that, that we'd send a couple of people to this class down at, there was a couple of Sonoma State women at, no. I guess one Sonoma State, one JC, I can't remember. Anyway, that went to a, a training session on how to start an Expanding Your Horizons conference. So we said, heck yeah, we'll do that. And within, I, it was really just a few months, we kind of pulled it all together and had our first one in 1993. Um, I ended up being the president, mostly because I don't think anybody else wanted to do it, and I kind of tend to um, drive meetings when they're not, you know, moving forward quickly. So, and with a lot of general, and no defense to academics, but sometimes the academics would go off in the weeds. It's like, no, we've got to get things done, we've got to make decisions. We've got to not go back to the decision we already made, we're going forward. So, you know, we decided that we're moving on, we're not talking about it anymore because we don't have time, we've got these other decisions to make. So, anyway, so I ended up getting to be the president. <laughs> so, um, but now we're doing our 20th conference this April. It's actually going to be on campus here on April 14th. So that's very exciting, and you know, I don't know, somebody asked me once how many students we've influenced, you know, or have we, we've actually had experiences, and so it's probably been a few thousand, right, of girls who've come through. We just do seventh and eighth grade, trying to make sure we get a, as deep a focus on those grades as we can, and also to make it easier for our, our workshop leaders. And what we have is it's um, hands-on um, uh, workshops with a woman professional, so they get the role model, they get hands-on experience, they get to choose which of a multitude of uh, workshops they get to attend. Um, in fact, I just signed my daughter up for, for, for the conference last night. And so she's you know, choosing through the different options. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, they can start to kind of figure out, okay, well maybe I'm interested in these things. And some of the stuff they just don't know. It's like, well, hopefully they'll try it and see, it might be something that inspires them. Um, but I think it's been really, um, rewarding for me to, to have these girls go through. They always start at the day extremely shy because, you know, they're 12, 13, 14, they're coming onto a campus, it's a little, a little, little intimidating, you know, and we kind of just send them off to the workshops. Um, but by the end of the day, they are so excited, they're so jazzed, they're so, you know, yeah, that was really fun, I mean, they're having a really good time. So um, I, I feel like, I mean, we don't get a lot of feedback because they kind of go off their own way, but. Um, we've heard back from a few, you know, that said that, you know, this, all we are is one of the things that helps them decide to go into that. And that's all I can ask for, is that we're one of the things that can help them launch in that direction and, and hopefully become, you know, go into the technical field and to know that it was there and that that would be something that would, would drive their passions. Because um, you really want something that you're working on, you know, as you work that, that helps, um, that meshes with what your passions are trying to make things better. So um, that was really about all I had to talk about. Um, I guess just to say, you know, it's been a good life. Here's my family. <laughs> and, uh, <Rupert> Tahoe. <laughs> so um, anyway, and, uh, um, you know, I'm hoping, although I gotta say, I'm not sure my daughter's going into technology, but I'm trying. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, and, you know, and part of that's, I think, backlash. She'll probably be an artist just to spite me or something. <laughs> but um, anyway, 
I don't know if you guys have any questions for me. Um, that's, about, that's about it. But I, I really find that um, being in engineering is really rewarding, and, and um, I really enjoy it. I'm learning all the time. You know, like I'd say, I'm learning metallurgy. You know, um, who, who would have thought? <laughs> but I learn from people every day. Yeah. So it's, I would say, maybe 10, 20 percent at most of, of the engineers at Agilent are women. I mean, I think we try to recruit. I've been actually very excited. We have like a handful of brand new women straight out of college that have recently joined, and I'm so excited by that. Because we actually weren't even doing any college hiring for a long time. So they, they do try to get, but you know, with, with 10 to 20 percent of the, the graduates being female, I think it's hard for them, and so I think there's there's some effort there to, to try to you know increase those odds, but I think it's still hard. Um, I think we had um, during our you know many layoffs that we had. I think there were you know maybe there was I don't know if it's disproportionate, but you know a lot of women decided to go into something different. I mean, a lot of men did too. So I don't know what those proportions were, but you know there were some rough times there where they went into other industries. And so um, there's a little bit of that, but I think I think the whole time I've been there, it's been you know 10, 20 percent, something like that. And so I would like to see more. <laughs> you know? So keep trying, and I, you know, it's like, well, has this actually been helping? Because you know we're not getting bigger percentages. Yeah, but at least we're you know for the most part we're maintaining. You know, uh, each each group of girls that comes through is a fresh brain, not knowing what the options are. So we just got to keep keep pushing on that and get get done what we can. But Agile is a big sponsor of um, Expand Your Horizons. And um, they are, they have been since the beginning. So um, that's been very good. And we actually just had a couple weeks ago, um, Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day, where we had uh, a lot of invited Girl Scouts, a couple other organizations, plus the Agile employees. And that was something that Agile sponsored. Um, to do this one day of an engineering challenge where the girls, we actually had to make a bridge um, out of prototype materials that were um, uh, gummy bears and spaghetti. No, 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 marshmallows and spaghetti were our prototype materials and then the actual final bridge, they could upgrade their materials to toothpicks and gummy bears. So, in a, a bunch of other things. So, it was really kind of an inventive way of showing that, you know, when you're doing a design, you often use inferior products for your first set just to test your concept move on to the next, but Agile paid for all of that. So they've been very um, supportive of you know, women um, progressing and moving forward. And um, so, yeah, I think it's been actually a very good atmosphere, too. Yeah, OK. I this is really more for Suzanne, or you're welcome to jump in. I, I'm having trouble following the logic of back from the beginning of why young women aren't finding their way to computer sciences. If the, if the, if the logic goes, they don't know it exists. That's the case for a lot of social sciences too. I mean, they don't know what and neither do the boys. So they don't know what anthropology is, or sociology is, or computers. I mean, why would the females not know that, or know that more or less than the males if they're not getting it in high school? So I'm really, you know, confused about that. <laughs> I'm like having trouble. With that. I think it's not. It's not only that they don't know what it is, but that. They think it's something else, or the aura that's around it. Is I mean, that's coded anthropology is a perfect yeah. example of that. Like they think it's right. dinosaurs or something, and, right? You know. And so it's about how <laughs> what they think it is appears in terms of gender schemas, right? And mm -hmm. I, that was sort of the reason I put up the slide I did on computer architecture because I just look at that and go, dudes. And I mean, I know yeah. what that is. I love it. I know everything about it. Yeah. But I just look at it this visceral, not for me reaction, right? Yeah. And so until you're deep into it, you can't possibly know. And then you look at the social sciences and you get these, you know, sort at of least they're social. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you know what it's like to do it. You haven't seen it in high school, but you're going off of just the aura around it, as far as you know, I think. Do you think there's some about it's you know, it's there's a, so much social pressure to be pretty and not smart? I mean, you know what I mean? 
I mean, to be the smart girl is not always the good thing. Um, I don't know if that's still the case in middle school or whatever. When, I mean, that's one of the reasons we, we focus on seventh and eighth is because it's such so much social pressure and all that kind of thing, and, and that's where girls tend to start dropping off as far as taking math. I mean, we're not seeing that in the calculus, so that's good to see. I really like seeing that, but, um, you know, I know that, that was some of the concerns that, you know, being being a nerdy girl is much more of a social stigma than being a nerdy boy. All right, well, I think now the pressure is to be perfect in every way. And so in these <laughs> disciplines, it's true, I mean, they're both, right? And so in these disciplines where there are lower grades across the board, you know, a woman getting a C reacts to that differently than a man getting a C in an electrical engineering course. And that's definitely been shown. Women leave when they leave the major with higher grades than the men leave. Hmm. Yeah, Do you think that the media plays a big part in the young women, how they see themselves, and their ability to actually expand their minds in the field of science by not having the media portray the wonderful beauty of the, of the female mind and its ability to create in such an atmosphere. So who do we have for those smart female role models? So, okay. The most, the, the ones that I've seen, yeah. and I've barely watched TV, is a lot of your actresses, it's the image that is portrayed out there yeah. of, of women is, is in the <coughs> acting field or modeling or whatever, which once again gets to the physical beauty aspect mm -hmm. as opposed to the mental awareness of, of the inner creative beauty within. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, even in general, I think in the media, there's not a whole lot about engineers, right? I mean, there's Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, you know, guys. But, um, and then, you know, I mean, a lot of the, the high tech, whatever, you know, startups and that kind of thing, mostly guys. Um, you know, there's no TV shows about, I mean, uh, CSI maybe is the closest we get for, for you know, something with technical content. Just that yeah, math that's, guy. What was that one? Numbers, is that the math guy? Yeah, it sounds like it. I never watched it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Bill Nye, yeah. the science guy, or there's, uh, you know, yeah, there's, um, you know, I mean, there were lawyer shows and, you know, a whole bunch of things, and even engineering in general isn't really, I, it maybe just not you know, attractive enough to show, it's a, as a, you know, MacGyver was maybe the best we had as far as, <laughs> as advertising, you know, that engineering could be fun and, and you could be really inventive in that, but, um, yeah, you know, there's not, there's just not much there, whereas there are the things that are there are more the, you know, looking attractive. I mean, even the, the Mythbusters guys, I mean, they only have one woman on the team. So, yeah, it's disappointing. Yes? Um, when you talked about the seventh and eighth grade girls who, who come in to the standing here for us, how many of them, do you know, how many of them already are interested in um, science and math and, and those kinds of things? And how many of them are just kind of coming in because their friends are doing it or their parents are that's a good question. And how many are coming in because their mom's coerced them into it and yeah, that sort of thing? Something. Yeah. And even those, I mean, they, they could be a little sullen at the you know, the first session. So, you know, any workshop leaders don't get too disappointed at the first session. It's always rough for everybody. But then, you know, second and third sessions are getting starting to get energized and kind of coming into their own a bit, you know, and realizing that they're, you know, no adults are watching over them or disciplining them or any of that kind of stuff. So, um, I think a lot probably do have some interest to start with. We actually try to reach out to like the Sonoma State um, Academic Talent Search Program and, and certain of the schools that, that are disadvantaged. You know, they have kids that aren't, you know, don't have college educated parents, that kind of thing, and hopefully do a lot of recruiting there. So, it, but yeah, I think a lot do have probably a, a tendency to like it. Yeah. Have you noticed any effect with with the fact that there are a few more boys attending Expanding Your Horizons now? Well, we've, how many, we've had that, um, boys attending for a long time, and uh, what we decided to do is, was the boys tend to um, change the entire atmosphere of the, the workshop, um, and so when we have more than a handful, we're, we're getting some guy presenters, you know, to lead workshops, and so that they have that male role model and kind of pulling them out of the general classes. And that's, I think, worked better as far as us servicing the girls. 
Um, and so we do that when there's enough that we can justify that. How many um, presenters, workshop leaders, are faculty from you know, here, the JC, and how many are from? Two or three, I think, are from the from um, Sonoma State or the JC. Okay, out of 16 this time. So we have 13 that are from, you know, other other professions. So there are yeah. three SSU for sure. Okay. And I'm not sure we have, we might have one JC, so maybe that's four out of those 16. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, get your daughters to sign up if you have seventh to eighth grade girls. <laughs> yeah. For the upcoming um, event. Well, there's an architect, there's architect, there's a veterinarian, there's nursing, there's um, engineering, um, chemistry, what are the... Uh, computer science. Computer science, yes. <laughs> 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 and, um, yes, yeah, so there's a bunch of them. I'm trying to think. There was one on sediment. I don't know who's doing that one, but, you know, got mud. I thought that was pretty good. Um, an orthodontist. Um, can they go to more than one? They'll go to three. To three. Okay. They'll go to three. So they sign up for six, we, we load them into three. You know, it depends on availability. And, and there's three sessions throughout the day, and then we have lunch. And then they um, we do a closing session and a wrap So, yeah. And we're still working on getting our brochure together, but registration is open. <laughs> so, yeah. see. <laughs> so, how yeah. many people come? Um, we've been. For the last few years, we've been around 200 girls. The most we ever had was 500. One time we had an astronaut come and talk. And I don't know what we did different. But um, we, <laughs> but um, I think that was probably also the last year before we actually have some restrictions on recruiting in the schools because it's a gender-specific activity. Even though we allow boys, it's still there's some restrictions on how we can go from teacher to student. That's kind of not as allowed. So um, that's, that's uh, hampered us a bit, but yeah, we have, I'm hoping we'll have 300 this time. So are these all hands-on workshops or are they presentations? Hands-on. Hands-on. We, we specifically require that, that the, um, that they be hands-on because that's where the girls run. They don't, they, I mean, they don't have the attention span for a presentation of any sort. They would be, you know, restless by now and talk, listen to us. Yeah. I'm curious why, um, what, what was the reason why you allowed boys to attend these, these, these workshops too, since this is a very good focus? <laughs> That's a complicated okay. answer. So, um, because even my own company um, is not, is technically doesn't support gender, you know, um, discriminatory activities, uh, okay? So, so we have to be sort of open. We also had, um, threats of being sued by an organization that was active here. I don't know if they still are or not, um, because it was gender specific, um, you know, girls only. And, um, you know, so we, we have left that open. I mean, I don't know how much it would hurt us if we, you know, just gave up on that. What I find most interesting is that of the Expanding New Horizons conferences throughout the United States, because there are a lot of them, and we're just local to Sonoma County, we're about the only one that has any boys attend at all. <laughs> like, you know, whatever. <laughs> you yeah, know. I usually look that happy in the workshop. There are there that have been in mind. Stunned, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, because they're the only boy usually. I mean, we try, actually, we actually deliberately try to do that because when you have two boys together, then they get disruptive. So, you know. But I, I have actually liked our, you know, if we end up with, like, say, more than five, they're, they're put into a, a, you know, we have them in a separate one. We have duplicate, you know, workshops that are duplicates of what we have. We have some guys on on standby to, to teach those <laughs> to teach those workshops, and then and they get the male perspective too. I mean, you know, like some a lot of the boys who come, it's like maybe all from one school where they're they're recruiting indiscriminately, right? And so and that's that's fine. And a lot of them are, you know, not well educated parents, and 
uh, you know, it's okay. It just we need them to to not distract the girls from their experience. Yeah, so it's a hard one. Anything else?